Arriba. Okay. Hi, today we're photographing lesser kestrels and I'm doing something slightly different. If you look on the top of the camera, I've got a rifle mic with the windshield on top of it because I need to record some of the sounds because I think I'll have trouble sourcing them to dub onto the film afterwards which is what I normally do. There are two hides here, one at the end of the building and one looking down the side and they can both be very good for birds perched on the roof and birds in flight. This is taken before the sun is really up, it's got an orangey glow to it. This is the male bird, it has no black on the head like the moustache that the common kestrel has. They're slightly smaller than the common kestrel too. As well as kestrels we had visits from other birds like the European roller. I think they were nesting at the far end of the building but we never went down that far but they would come and land on the perches close to the hide. And another very Spanish bird, the hoopoe. Quite a spectacular bird. It's a very typical place to find a hoopoe. They will nest in holes in buildings like this. And lots of house sparrows. Long way to go to photograph a house sparrow, but they were displaying, which is always nice to see and photograph. And a few jackdaws too. Old buildings like this are also very good places for jackdaws. Let's talk briefly about the one-way glass that we're photographing through. All of the hides at El Torre have one-way glass and many hides around the world do these days. Optically it does vary. I'm told by photographers who know far more about this than I do that the thicker the glass the better. So 3mm glass is optically better than 2mm glass. Things you can do to improve the chances of getting good pictures for yourself are take the lens hood off. Have the front of your lens close to the glass, about 3 inches away. That way any imperfections in the glass are out of focus. The interior of these hides are painted a dark black or brown. This is to avoid reflections in the glass. You can help that by wearing a dark top. Don't wear a white t-shirt. You might get some ghosting in the picture. The darker your clothes the better. Ideally you should be shooting with a lens at right angle to the glass looking in a straight line. But obviously if a bird lands off to your right hand side you've got to start shooting at an angle. That is when you're likely to hit a flaw in the glass. I was once doing a hoopoe at about a 45 degree angle and the first burst of pictures none of them were sharp. I very carefully refocused on the bird's eye and again nothing was sharp. I did it a third time and again everything soft. Looking through the viewfinder they looked fine. I then moved the tripod about 3 or 4 inches and took another burst and they were all sharp. I can only guess that there was an optical fault in the glass at that one point and shooting at an angle through it really showed it up. So when you're shooting at an angle be very careful to check your images. It may be you've just got to move the camera slightly. Here you can see the one bird's pulling at the other bird's tail. He's trying to pull him out of the nest hole. 
This is two males having a squabble. You can see the advantage of shooting early in the morning, the light is low, gets underneath the bird's wings. If you took these photographs in the middle of the day, they would look rather flat. Early morning light, late evening, that's when you should be photographing. Focus sensitivity I keep on plus two these days because I've noticed when you have the bird detection on, it doesn't recognize other objects coming into the picture and get distracted by them. So here, another bird flies across the bird you're in focus on, but it remains focused on that first bird. I guess this blob in front of our bird doesn't get recognized as another bird. It just doesn't have a bird shape to it at this point. So the focus remains on the bird you want it to be focused on. There were chicks of all sorts of ages, from very well-grown youngsters to small fluffy ones like this. But they were impossible to count, you didn't even know if you were looking at the same one. This is quite a well-grown youngster, and then his head would appear under another bit of slate, so you didn't really know if it was the same bird. A lot of the food that was coming in was insects, like small crickets. But here you can see the colony and the number of birds that were present. I put a lot of time into slow motion video of flying kestrels. A very difficult subject to do, you've got to manually focus. When you're doing it in slow motion, at least if you can keep it in focus for two seconds and you're shooting at five times slow, you've got 10 seconds worth of film. But nevertheless, it's very difficult to do and I wasted a lot of time doing it. This is a relatively short flight. I really wanted longer flights than this. And you're looking for that pattern, something that's happening on a regular basis. And eventually I realized that this particular bit of slate attracted quite a bit of fighting, both between two males and then two females, and here a male and a female but there was also quite a regular flight. And they were flying in the same direction time and time again. And these were my best slow motion video shots. And they're taken using the Lumix GH6 camera, another micro four third body, so I can use the same lens. This is the male this time and it's 120 frames per second at 4K, which the OM-1 body won't do, which is why I've got the GH6. Stock doves was another bird that was regular on top of the roof. It's also a bird that often uses old barns to nest in, and I like stock doves. Always had a thing about stock doves. <laughs> and some recently fledged stock doves that were still demanding to be fed. So in next week's fifth and final film on Spain, we'll be looking at the most wonderful photogenic lagoon that was absolutely full of waders, including these coloured pratincoles. Thanks for watching. 
Now if you're interested in going on a trip to El Torre, there's more than one way to do it. There are British tour companies you can join that will go out there, but you can also book it direct. And I'll put the website for El Torre in the description underneath the video. You can contact them, they've got very good English by email, you'll have no problems booking it up. They can book the accommodation, airport uh, transit as well from the airport to the, the side. But there's a third way, which is probably the best way. I'll put the website in for Rennie de Heer, who is a Dutch gentleman who lives in the UK and he organises trips to El Torre, but you don't pay him. You're only paying direct to El Torre at their normal prices. Rennie just likes the company, he just likes people to go with and he goes there more than once a year and it's well worth joining up with him. He actually organised this trip for the six of us that went but unfortunately he had to drop out at the last moment but that is probably the best way to go.